All right, I'd like to call this meeting to order. And um, recognizing that we are missing two um, Board of Adjustment members, um, uh, I wonder if you all would entertain. I'll make a motion to amend the agenda to table item number three, election of officers um, for a uh, forthcoming Board of Adjustments meeting. All those second, all in favor? All right, so we'll strike out number three. Um, and at this time, I'd like to recognize any visitors that are here uh, for anything that's unrelated to uh, business that is on the agenda for tonight. Um, um, and uh, seeing none, we'll um, move on. Um, and uh, this is uh, looking at November 30th minutes motion has been made to accept the minutes of november 30th 2022 I'll second, that. second and all third uh, motion carries and we're on to new business uh, first item on the agenda is jmh rentals llc gene hogg owner and um, Joey Brandle is the applicant this is for 61 Mary Street requesting a conditional use permit for a short-term rental in an R3 or multi-family residential zone um. good evening I'm Valerie Himes. I'm an attorney. Um, my office is at 450 Big Hill Avenue in Richmond, but I actually live here in Berea. Um, and just as an aside, I serve on the Board of Adjustments for Madison County and have for several years. And before that, had served on the Board of Adjustments for the City of Richmond. So I appreciate the work you do and appreciate the opportunity to be on this side of the hearing. Um, I represent JMH Rentals, Jeannie Hogg, and this particular um, conditional use is for 61 Mary Street, which is leased to Joey Brindale, and Joey is here. Um, this board, you might remember, approved a short-term rental for the adjoining 63 Mary Street, so this is the adjoining property. Um, he's requesting a conditional use permit for a short-term rental in an R3 zone. Uh, the property is 600 feet, so he's asking for three occupants in accordance with what you all have approved in the past. Um, he does have two off-street parking spaces um, and is agreeable to a 10 p.m. check-in. And he, can, he is present and can answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank you very much. Um, and Amanda, just to be clear, uh, public notices have gone out with everything on the new business for, for tonight's agenda. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> all notices have been sent as required. And as uh, uh, Ms. Himes mentioned, it, it, uh, we have previously approved the other side of the duplex. So um, this is the second unit of a duplex, um, just to be clear on what we're considering. Um, in the past, uh, just as a reminder, the board has put conditions on um, these short-term rentals for a, again, a 10 p.m. check-in time and that the, um, sh that the conditional use permit goes with the property owner, um, so it would not transfer in the case of a title transfer. With the uh, off-street parking, um, with this being a duplex, is that two off-street? That's, uh, that's identified for um, 61 Mary Street, not 63? Yes, he, he has okay. a total of four, so two for each side. Right. Anyone have any uh, thing they'd like to discuss? No. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the conditional use permit for a short-term rental in an R3 zone for 61 Mary Street. Any? Oh, yes, and that we have a 10 p.m. check-in. The conditional use goes with the owner. Um, you have to have 200, 
square feet living sp space for each person and uh, the two off street parking places. Motion has been made for um, conditional use in R3 zone for a short term rental um, for 61 Mary Street, uh, check in before 10 p.m. with two off street parking and uh, with a 200 square foot per person, so a, a limit of three person stay and that the conditional use would uh, um, would uh, be with the owner and not with the property. I'll second that motion. Second and I'll third motion carries and approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> and second uh, second item on the agenda is uh, again J JMH Rentals <coughs> LLC Gene Hogg and this is on 131 Washington Avenue um, and this is requesting a conditional use permit for short-term rental in an R2 two-family residential zone. All right. And just to remind you, I'm still Valerie Himes. I represent uh, the property owner. This particular property is 1,300 square feet. Um, it does have the two off-street parking places that you require. Um, she is agreeable to the 10 p.m. check-in. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, Jeannie is a reputable and responsible local landowner and landlord. She's been a local landlord for over 30 years. Uh, she's also present here and can answer any questions that you might have. I'll make a motion that we accept uh, conditional use permit in the R2 zone at 131 Washington Avenue. The permit goes with the property owner. Uh, you said uh, 1,300 square feet. Yes. That's going to put about six, eight people, six it's people. Six people. Mm -hmm. Six people. Uh, total max out uh, check-in time of before 10 p.m. and two off-street parking. Um, should do. I'll second that. My name is Heather West. I live right beside the 130. Is it 131? Um, so yeah, I mean, I kind of I do to swear you in. Oh, okay. You swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, ma'am. And state your address for the record. 129 Washington Avenue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just, I don't know. I'm kind of worried about it. Like <clears throat> we live right next door. Um, I am aware that the house, I don't know if it's been owned by the same people for a long period of time, but um, it's definitely had a lot of repair issues that's needing to be done. It looks like it's being addressed right now. Um, people moving in and out of, of the house um, a lot. Um, and I'm worried with, with this. I don't know how it is on the other streets. I've not even known that there was I'm assuming it's an Airbnb um, places. Um, my biggest concern is I I go to bed at nine o'clock and I have to have really good rest. <laughs> I, I commute an hour away um, and an hour back and, um, and, and trees and things like that around the yard. Um, I, I have some questions about that as well. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I've never been to any of these, so I do apologize. But I'm just, just some fair concerns about the noise level um, and things like that. You can? Certainly, yeah. Please. Yes, Or you please. can go to that. Okay. 
and uh, we'll do the same exercise. Um, <coughs> share your name and address, and uh, okay. you'll be sworn I'm in. Jeannie Hogg, and I am the property owner, and we have owned that property for over 30 years. Um, Let me swear you in. Do you swear from, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Um, we have owned it that long. Um, the last tenant was there two and a half years. Um, and uh, I was trying to remember. Usually they're there two to three years. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure how long you've lived there. But um, I am very uh, responsible with them. If there's a complaint, I've never had a complaint from you on my property. Uh, we have done, are in the process of just, you know, putting new floors, remodeling, I mean, um, new appliances, new blinds. Uh, I always have a noise clause if there's any noise whatsoever. And typically, um, I mean, this is my first Airbnb. Joey, who's my tenant, has ran his Airbnb out of that. Um, and typically they check in way before the 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. But if you had any problem whatsoever with noise, all you would have to do is call me. I'd share my number with you. Okay. And we would address that immediately. And they won't be parking on the street where yeah. I know where they've been working on it. Right. And there's a lot That's of, been a lot of, because we had to, I'm very safety conscious. And so we tore out the steps. There were kind of two sections. And so we got rid of one section and re poured the, um, um, what do you call that? <laughs> Sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm putting up handrails on the porch. and. There'll be a safety rail at the other door because I'm very safety conscious as well, and there'll be extra liability insurance. I always increase the uh, insurance as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, since um, I think since my husband's lived in the house with me, um, and, and that's been for almost four years. It'll be four years, I think, in April. I know we've had, there's been like four different, um, four, I think, what, was it four different sets of occupants? At least three, yeah. Um, I, I mean, on my leases, unless that was something unknown, because I have my leases from the last, you know, 10 years, and mm -hmm. the last one was there two and a half years, and then the one before that, I actually can't remember, but. Okay. All right, Um. so yeah, if we can get we could get your phone number, I guess, in case we have any issues with um, someone next door being really loud or um, scary or <laughs> someone we feel like we um, are worried about. I'm usually not a complainer. I'm, I, I, <laughs> I understand. I never really complain about um, anyone in the neighborhood except for the ones that used to live on the other side of us. That was a whole separate <laughs> issue. Um, law always had to get yeah involved and um that was not yeah it was not good but we've got good neighbors now on the other side of us so that's good but okay that's so i will just clarify that um these conditions that are set as part of this conditional use permit by the board are hard and fast rules so um, a 10 p.m. check-in time is a mandatory thing if that is a condition set by the board. Mm -hmm. um, the off-street parking is a mandatory thing as set by the board. Mm -hmm. um, and now noise ordinances is, is a little bit different. The city actually does not have a noise ordinance. Mm -hmm. So that would be something that you all would need to work out between property owners as a civil matter. Um, but any of those other items, I will tell you that if the property owners are not abiding by that, in the terms of the conditional use permit, mm -hmm. um, you can contact our office and they will be brought back before this board um, for a possible um, revocation of that permit if those rules are not continued to be met. So there is a safeguard, in other words. Um, that the conditions that we apply to these permits mm -hmm. be met. Okay. Any noise between before nine o'clock, I really don't care. I've got four kids. So <laughs> I'm probably not gonna hear it. But at nighttime I need to sleep. <laughs> 
but yeah, so that sounds that sounds fair to me. Did did you have? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you for addressing. You're welcome. The question. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any um, issues that we've had with any short terms in terms of uh, not meeting those um, conditions. That, that we have not had any complaints, and I will say um, that generally speaking, um, the 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 comments that we have had have been good mm -hmm. um, in terms of people tend to upkeep the property better because the property owners are on site more often than long-term rental um, so that's what we hope for you know we hope for um, you know good safe clean living conditions for for those people and we hope that they're good neighbors the the thing the cautionary thing that we're I, I hope I can speak for us just trying to get a sense on is uh, with this popularity what what could it mean in terms of density of short-term rentals within a neighborhood to sort of change how that you know neighborhood is not a neighborhood you don't know your neighbors anymore so it, it does seem like there needs to be some sort of balance and and um, I do see on the agenda that we have a work session to discuss short-term rental regulations and this might be a topic of our discussion at that work session. Great. Um, I think we need to reframe, rephrase the motion, if there is a, a motion, um, as, we, uh, as we departed our prior um, motion. <laughs> I'll redo the motion. Then. I want to make a motion to accept the conditional use permit for uh, 131 Washington Avenue with those stipulations of 10 p.m. check-in time no later than two all-street parking a, m a maximum of what four occupants and this would be in an R2 six six, six. six okay uh, any, anything else um, and did he say the conditional yeah, use permit goes with the owner okay all right is there a second second all right um, and I'll uh, approve as well. And uh, so that is for a conditional use for short-term rental at, at 131 Washington Avenue uh, with the conditions that there'll be check-in uh, before 10 p.m., two off-street parking spaces, uh, a maximum uh, number of um, uh, people is six, and, um, and that would it stay with the property owner and, and not with the property. Great. Um, Ms. Hogg, just as a follow-up, um, because this is your first Airbnb, just to let you know, it is subject to transient room tax, and um, so you will need, uh, we will actually notify the finance office um, that you've been approved for this. You'll need to contact our office to do a life safety check. So when you get your repairs made to your house and you're ready to rent it out, just contact our office. We'll come do a life safety check, and then you'll be um, can get the business license for the transient room tax and all that those things taken care of with the finance office so you'll need to contact them I'm not sure how you report the transient room tax but okay okay thank you all right next um, business is um, Ed Easton hog and this is 122 Christmas Ridge Road uh, also requesting a conditional use permit. This is for a short-term rental in an R1 single-family residential zone. And um, who will be coming up to speak? We'll have you sworn in. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And if you will state your name and address for the record, please. Ed Easton Hogg, 140 Holly Hill Drive, Korea, Kentucky. Thank you. Uh, same as everybody else is saying, needing the short-term conditional use permit. Going to be doing an Airbnb out of the home. It's 1,500 square feet, three bedrooms. I'm asking for six-person capacity in line with all these rules we've talked about, 10 p.m. check-in. Um, I'd also like to uh, request to be allowed to 
have someone camp in the backyard. And that's all I have to say. Can you identify which property that is on the on the map? I just can't quite. Okay. All right. How is the park parking delineated? Are there the driveway? Um, the driveway going between those homes is uh, the property line. The whole drive is on my side of the property. There's a curb between those. So then there's the two car garage in the back and then roughly two spots there the pavement extends past the garage so here mm -hmm. okay. and um, you're asking for a conditional use to to uh, rent a outside camping space yes in addition to the Airbnb for the interior of the home. Correct. Am I understanding that right? Correct. So how would that work if you had uh, somebody to rent the home and then you had somebody else to rent the backyard as a camping site? One model of Airbnb rentals is that you can rent the individual rooms and everyone has access to the community living areas. So they, they would uh, if the outside camping rental would would have access to bathroom, kitchen. Yes. And what would their shelter be? A tent. It could be a tent or their van. Um, that'd be up to them. Something of that degree, preferably a tent. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious how this addresses our, our health requirement. It's, it's, have not faced this before. So, yeah. Or, yeah. Um, so I think as, um, so our regulations, our city ordinance is very specific to say that um, dwellings um, must provide clean sanitary safe conditions we do have minimum housing standards um, where plumbing has to be provided um, obviously a kitchen um, I, I'm first curious to I want to see if was was that part of the application part of the request that was made if I recall right it was just property address <coughs> yeah so as, as part of our application you know we we do ask for a um, a statement outlining what is being proposed um, and so I think you know from a from a codes perspective I would need more information about um, <clears throat> about what that would look like. Um, so I think living in a van is, um, I, I'd have to find the ordinance that does not allow you to um, live in a van on your property. I do know specifically the one about the tent though, and it does say that you cannot occupy a tent for more than seven days on a property. So um, it just may take me a few minutes to find those. So um, what I'd like to do is get an opportunity, um, again, because it was not part of the application, I, I didn't prepare for this either. Um, I'm gonna unplug my computer, find some resources from our city ordinances. Well, can I make a quick suggestion? Because cause I, I, I do almost feel like that, uh, that we haven't done due diligence with public notice for that aspect of it um, 
and so I would ask you if, if this is something that you would like to make um, a request for conditional use uh, that you would I would I would almost I would suggest coming back um, with that in the application so that we can have public notice for that if it's if it's something that you're um, having heard that if, if you're think it's not um, uh, worth that then then we could um, we could make a motion uh, based on the merits of the application yeah and I think that's the board's decision if you <clears throat> and the applicant you know if he wants to if you want to have the house considered and the basically the living space of the house um, considered this evening I think the board would be prepared to um, consider that item um, but I think if it is anything more than that I think we need um, information regarding how that's going to be um, managed from a property owner perspective and um, and let's um, probably consider that again I, I agree with the chairman at a separate meeting um, the the issue with tabling the matter is that um, if we table it that does not require additional public notice I would need to talk to legal counsel because my opinion is that's a separate application that that's a separate request than what we saw in the application um, so we'll need to talk about is does that if you want to apply for that is that a separate application fees public notice all those things so what do you suggest um, I think the applicant should um, tell us whether you would like for the interior space of the home to be considered this evening Um, <clears throat> on the application I indicated that I'd be doing an Airbnb through it and camping is a common common listing on B&B's I'm completely willing to follow the uh, current uh, ordinance in place as a cap of seven days I wouldn't even expect that to be happening the uh, maintenance of the property would be of uh, utmost concern and priority as always for us there would wouldn't be any campfires um, I'd like to have the uh, board vote on it with all due respect I don't think that um, there's been proper public notice because this application doesn't say anything about camping in the backyard in a tent so I think that from my perspective I would not feel comfortable to vote on that because it's not even in here I have one other question too you might clear me up on something if you have somebody in the tent and they're there seven days and you have people in the house how comfortable would those people in the house be having somebody come from a tent that they may not even know to use the same facilities and a comp that may not may not may not be too good unless you can come up with some idea because you said living in the tent there won't be any water in the tent unless they have their own or their own bathroom facilities out there and I'm sure that that would be another problem yeah. but the co-mingling there too different I think that needs to be addressed as well it's a good idea though there's this is a very common situation um, I travel a whole lot and I've stayed at many many places where you rent different rooms the bathroom is shared by all people people are coming and going people have different schedules some are there for a few days I've done this I would say 80 90 percent of my travels this is new to us it might may not be new to you and, and I'm simply requesting that this not be denied based on something like that but I'm I'd like to have it voted on I don't, I'm not hearing something to say no this can't happen or that it's against some other ordinance I'm only hearing like critiques about my business model
weren't there weren't any uh, more requirements in the application for more detail <clears throat> there were um, so it says to attach a um, written statement outlining what is being proposed that should have been so, on the back of page three I think it was all handwritten. But, um, but again, just the idea of having. Um, Do you have that? It was all handwritten on the back of my application. I page. don't have it with me. I'm sure it is in our public record. Okay, so minimum standards for habitation. Um, every habitable room. Um, so, so our ordinance talks about every dwelling. Um, and again, with Airbnb, typically we're talking about dwellings. Um, uh, shall contain, um, we're obviously working plumbing, um, lavatories, a room which affords privacy to a person, um, kitchen sink, uh, bath, shower, uh, water heating facilities. Um, every dwelling, dwelling unit, and rooming house shall be supplied with potable water supply. Um, let me see if I can find our tent camping. So um, we do have <clears throat> for rooming housing, rooming houses, no person shall operate a rooming house or shall occupy or let another for occupancy any rooming unit um, in any rooming house except in compliance with the provisions of every part of this division. Um, so at least one flush water closet, lavatory base, basin, and bathtub or shower properly connected to a water and sewer system approved by the building official and in good working order. Um, the operator of every rooming house shall um, provide bed linens and towels, um, provide at least 70 square feet of floor space um, for sleeping purposes, safe unobstructed exits. Um, the operator of every rooming house shall be responsible for sanitary uh, maintenance. Um, It goes on to say housing hazards. The conditions enumerated in this division are determined to be hazardous and shall warrant a finding that a building or its premises are unsafe and or constitute a nuisance. And, and that um, just basically says that, so these are gonna be our property maintenance. Um, regulations to say the building or structure has to be kept in a certain manner. I'm going to go to one other document.
<clears throat> okay, so it looks like dwelling is um, defined as a building or mobile home or part thereof used and occupied for human habitation or intended to be so used provided that temporary housing as herein after defined shall not be regarded as a dwelling and temporary housing is defined as a tent travel trailer or other portable structure or vehicle used for human shelter which is not attached to the ground another building or structure or any utility for more than 30 consecutive days um, no person shall occupy or reoccupy or let another to occupy or reoccupy any dwelling or dwelling unit rooming house or rooming unit nor shall water electric or gas utilities be supplied by the city or utility company until an occupancy certificate has been issued so basically i think that in itself lets us um it is probably enough to say that must be a dwelling to be um, allowed to be occupied. Yeah, that having that um, 30 days without reoccupy um, sounds mm -hmm. very clear. Um, mm -hmm. What what is the square footage of the structure of the residence? Do you have a rough 1500. idea? 1500. 1500. 1500. Okay. No, it's, as chair, I wouldn't be making a motion, um, but uh, we don't. Uh, I'm a I'm a part of the quorum tonight, and and I I would um, I would uh, I would not be voting for um, um, uh, conditional use for temporary uh, camp, uh, and I'd uh, entertain a motion if there is a motion. I just have the question um, in this application there doesn't say anything about a tent so are you are you seeking approval for not only this dwelling but also a camp in the backyard everything I'm requesting conditional use of that property for short-term rental so if somebody wants to park their car and sleep overnight in the driveway and give me 20 bucks I'm good with it if somebody wants to pay 20 bucks and put a tent up use the bathroom in the house I'm good with it so if this doesn't go through it's it's the stance that I'm understanding that for the city of Berea, you won't be permitting people to park campers, no form of tent camping. Correct. Our ordinance does not allow that. And we have addressed that on many occasions, other locations. So, you know, we have occasionally had people living in RVs on a on a site, and we have dealt with that um, from a regulatory perspective. Sounds fair. We'll stay with the house then. I understand. Is there anybody in the uh, in the audience that uh, uh, would like to comment on this request? Come on up. Well, you will have to um, get sworn in. And <clears throat> do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And could you please state your name and address for the record? My name. My name is Terry Wyatt. I own the property directly behind their their uh, was 122. My home address is 1607 uh, Big Hill Road. Thank you. And the only thing I'm concerned about is, is uh, uh, especially I didn't know about the possibility of, of tent camp, which makes me a little more concerned, is uh, that is our property directly behind you. 
and there was a fence there that's uh, a wooden fence that was part of that property. It's falling down. Uh, there is a very old fence that was on my property that I will be repairing, but I just want to make sure that 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 property boundary is is uh, uh, honored. That uh, um, I don't have to worry about somebody coming back into my woods. I've got quite a few acres of woods back there. Uh, we've had trouble with people starting fires, throwing trash. There's quite a bit of trash even behind the house. It's there. It's been there for a long time. It's nothing that, that just happened. So, but it's a problem we've been having over for well as long as my family has owned that property. That's the only thing I'm really concerned about. So my question is, is that fence that's in the back of your property going to be replaced or uh, repaired or uh, changed in any way? I can't recall offhand what that fence looks like. Is it a large square wire fence? Um, the fence that's there now is an old wooden fence um, that has, um, I can show you a picture of it. If the fence needs to be repair, repaired or uh, redefined, whatever, yeah, the, the by fence, all means, that would be fine. Yeah, but are, are you going to do that? Yeah, that sounds like a good project if it needs to be yeah, done. I mean, it'd make it look a lot better back there. But yeah, I just we'll want to make sure that, that any of your guests, even if it's Airbnb, that especially people that come there periodically, they're here, there, they're gone, they need to have a good definition of a boundary. Okay. It's unreasonable. We'll get it done. Okay, thank you very much. Is there a motion? The tent stuff is gone. No, right. Completely gone. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a recommendation to, that we approve the conditional use permit for uh, 122 Christmas Ridge, uh, 10 p.m. check-in time, two off-street parking spaces, maximum of six persons in the home, 1,500 square feet home, uh, and that the permit stay with the owner if he sells the property. We've got a motion for a conditional use for a short-term rental at 122 Christmas Ridge road an r1 zone and um, check-in time before 10 p.m uh, with two off street parking um, i heard a maximum number of six occupants and that the conditional use would stay uh, with the owner and not with the property yes and i'd like to amend the motion uh, to indicate that this is only for the dwelling itself, not for uh, tent or van camping. Uh, amendment has been made to um, add a condition that uh, specifically uh, bars um, uh, occupying outside space. Is there a second? Second. Second. Um, motion carries. I'll um, approve. And um, next item on the agenda. Thank you. Um, so um, if you will contact our office for a life safety check of the structure before you rent it out. And um, um, Again, it is subject to transient room tax, so you'll need to get a business license for that. Thank you. One more item uh, of business on our um, business session, and this is uh, Rebecca Easton Hogg, uh, 207 Mount Vernon Road, and uh, this is also a conditional use permit for a short-term rental. This time it's in a B1, a minor business district zone. Have you sworn in? And Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. And could you state your name and address for the record, please? Rebecca Easton Hogg. Thank you. I'm uh, just requesting the conditional use permit for an Airbnb. At that property, it has two units, one downstairs, one upstairs. Each are 800 square feet. 
there's parking for two in the back and parking for two in the front. Um, so the total for anyone staying in the bottom is four people and then anyone staying in the top would be four people as well. One in the bottom unit and one in the top unit. So that building, is it already set up as two apartments? Mm -hmm. It is. And how, how, how will you achieve the four off street parking spaces? In the front, there's a gravel, there's a gravel area in the front and in the back where that car is parked, there's two spots right there where that red garbage can is, that person would scooch over and then you would have two spots there. So both of these parking areas that would back out onto these roads, that's how they access that? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Is that parking between, I don't know what the address is of the next road to the south on Mount Vernon, but it, it seems to look like that's a shared driveway. Is that, is that right? It's not a shared driveway. No, that, that belongs to their house. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we really are just talking about the off-street parking off of Cherry Road. No, there's a spot in the front of that house that does have like a gravel area. Is this where I'm, I've got my cursor? Is that what you're talking about? No, that belongs to them. Scooching forward in there, right in there. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the... Uh, we can't get can we get a street view of that i'm just one i'm wondering if you can actually back into cherry road and not into 25. that's a and I, well i when, i mean when people park there are they parking you know, like you park on the shoulder of a road? They're parking like the, the nose of their car, like in towards the house. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So they would, they would then the be backing out onto the street then? They do, yeah. Yes. That's where the renters are parking right now. Looks like um, somebody from would like to come up and speak on this. Come on up. I'm Ed Easton Hogg. Um, they'll often park parallel to 25 and then they pull out forward. And I think there's a little more gravel in the front yard than what that picture is depicting right now. They don't park up by the highway. Thank you. Are you all a little confused? I, I, I hear one um, uh, it sounds like they do park parallel to in other words if somebody were to park there they would be parked facing north and then they could just pull back into 25 without backing into 25 but but then you earlier said that they're parking with their nose facing the building so if they were to to leave they would have to actually back into 25 and not just pull right off 
the shoulder onto 25. Is that just trying to get a sense of what's what's going on there? I I feel like he could you could really park either way on that. Okay. But I mean, I guess I've seen him park both ways, really. Okay. But I think mostly going this way. I think on busy roads, we've just tried to avoid any, uh, trying to minimize, um, you know, backing into traffic as opposed to being able to turn around and face the road and then pull into the into the road. So. Yeah, I guess really you could, even if you were perpendicular, you could back, go on to Cherry Road, and then on to 25 as well, either way you went, perpendicular to the house or parallel to the house. Yep. You could go this way and out and around, or you could zoom out that way too, either mm -hmm. way. Okay. Not that I know of. No. What I'm saying is, if two people park parallel there with 25 on Mount Vernon Road, would it block those folks you at all, or do they use that other driveway for their parking? They, I believe that they, I'm not sure actually that they use that other square parking. I feel like that is their parking, that longish driveway. And there is more gravel coming this way on our property, for sure. No one reached out to us. <clears throat> yeah, it does. Yeah. So maybe they do use that one as well. I really don't know. With the off street parking on on a Cherry Road is I, that shed is not part of this property is that the property line basically where the where the uh, edge of that that's the edge of the property yeah. parking okay yeah that doesn't belong to but it, it does look like you could it does look like it's fairly big for just two is that really just two parking spots on in that area okay. it is yeah yeah Anybody have any questions? Is there anybody that like to else that would like to speak on this request? Chair would entertain a motion. Is one? So if I'm just wondering if you were to rent out both of these at the same time, and there were, are, are they going to have enough room to park all these vehicles? They should. Yes, they should. For f like, if, if let's say each unit had two cars, cars. each, mm -hmm. would there be enough to park for four cars? There would be. Yes. Okay. There would be. Is is the uh, plan to but separate not more than that? <laughs> really? Is the plan to separate the parking so one unit would have the that's the twenty five parking and the other would have the cherry? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's how it is now. The upstairs unit S. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. Yep. Well, come on up. We'll get you on the record and have you in front of the mic. Yep. Jeannie Hogg. But as you said, there is more parking in the back, so you could possibly designate extra spots in the back and have one of the front ones and one in the back if you wanted to. 
It's possible. I mean, it's possible, but it, it's really... You would have to do two here and then one behind. Mm. Mm-hmm. So... We'll just mention as a reminder um, in previous um, considerations, um, we have made provisions for pulling straight out onto. Um, so again, just as a reminder, that is something that we have discussed in the past. Uh, forward approaching, I shouldn't say straight, forward approaching. And, and can that be done? I, I, I'm trying to think because I don't know. I'm trying to remember what that front looks like. At some point, there's a wall, right, before you get to the building in the front to, to keep water from flowing into the building. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a little... Is the, if, if, the, if it was necessary to increase the parking area closer to the building on the on 25 side in order to allow cars room to turn around and face forward to pull out onto 25 is that is that something that could be done i feel like there's the space to do it okay yeah yeah i feel like there's the space to do it mm -hmm. have any other questions or Motion. Four up, four down. There are. Mm -hmm. would, would I'll second Any that. Second? Um, and I'll... Um, I'll say yay. So, um, motion is uh, granted for a conditional use for short term rental um, at uh, 207 Mount Vernon Road, uh, B1 district, with uh, four off street parking. Check in no later than 10. Um, um, maximum of four occupants in, the, uh, in each unit and the, um, the conditional use will stay with the owner. All right, thank you. That concludes our new business. Um, and uh, I think it's been a long time since we've had a work session, so let's have a work session. <coughs> we need to uh, make a motion to adjourn the business session. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn the business section? I'll make a motion that motion? we adjourn the business session. Thank you. Motion carries. All right, great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. draft of uh, the conditional um, I'm sorry the uh, short-term rental um, kind of mandatory requirements um, so as we discussed before in our work session um, we looked at a number 
of short-term rentals per city street and the feedback that I got on that was well we have some short streets some long streets what do we do when they change names blah 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 so <laughs> <laughs> um so what I have found is um a quantifier for um how we regulate these is really hard to come up with you know if we look at so many per mile so many per street um, I think our overall the board's concern has been at what point does your neighborhood change um, so and again I have not um, taken these before our legal counsel what I wanted to do is see if the board can if we can capture what we think these regulations should look like and then we'll take it to legal counsel and then of course it would go to planning commission then it, uh, city council for final approval um, so if you look at um, the top of the page for allowable land uses you go down to short-term rental so the blue wording is anything new um, so I would put a I would call attention to C section 408 a because that's going to direct you to the rate the kind of hard and fast regulations um, and then I have put that they are conditional slash permitted that's something I want to run by the attorney so there's going to be certain instances where they are conditional in certain instances where they are permitted generally speaking they're going to be permitted um, so the way that I have written this Actually, I unhooked my computer and I need it. So give me just a second here. I take it item six on here was came from an area that has very standard residential subdivision uh, you know like four blocks per subdivision or something that 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 obviously doesn't apply to us I take it that's why that was striked out Amanda um, th yeah that's correct okay so let me get my map open so what I looked at was how can we regulate a density that is a measurable um, that makes sense that um, our office can um, that we can determine upon an application so what I have um, now let me get some of this stuff off my map okay all right so um, so the the regulations would be the provisions for short-term rental shall apply to detached single-family dwellings duplexes and multifamily dwellings so what that means just in and of itself is that if you are applying for anything different than that you must come to the board of adjustment so if it's an rv parked in your yard if it's a tent if it's anything other than dwelling duplex or multifamily, um it now we know that that doesn't fall into this um so any but any of those in permitted zones in accordance with um this section up here for allowable land uses so I, I'm specific in stating that each unit rented for short-term rental on a transient basis, less than 30 days, shall comply with the following. So we would take the application um, into the codes and planning office. Um, we would um, make sure that they meet all of these requirements. So in other words, like the a couple of those tonight they would have come here because it would not have been easily identifiable to us that they had off street parking you know those things 
Um, one thing I do think that we might want to look at is off street and forward facing. I don't know that for sure though. That's something we need to talk about because most houses are not gonna, you're not gonna be able to forward face going out. Um, anyway, so, so if they're approved, then those short term rentals have to register with us on an annual basis. The reason that we want that annual registry is so that we know which are still operating, which aren't, um, because that's going to help us with this density requirement. Um, so current business license shall be maintained. Short-term rental is subject to transit room tax. Registration is non-transferable, so a new property owner would have to come and file for a new application. So the next um, one that's highlighted kind of sets those parameters, dwelling units or duplex units. In an agriculture, R1, R1A, and R2. So what I try to do is identify where we have more residential type settings. And in those zones, I put that they shall not be closer than an eighth mile diameter. And just um, for an exhibit, I, I did, um, so my map is not showing up good, but um, so this is vineyard subdivision. Um, so each of these circles is an approximate eighth mile diameter. Um, actually, just for the sake of it, let me go to Jackson Street because I put one on Jackson Street too. Um, and maybe my map will actually come in. Yeah, here we go. So I pulled these on um, Jackson Street and I pulled them in Vineyard just so we would have an idea. Now this yellow line measured 498 feet is um, where two of our short-term rentals on Center Street are. So that we have two about 500 feet apart. Mm -hmm. This eighth mile is just over that. So it's 660, I think. Um, but, um, but that's gonna be, real, you know, just to give you an idea mm -hmm. of what that looks like. Um, so basically this would be a measurable that we can um, have our GIS department put this as a layer on a map so that as we get these applications in we can pull this diameter this eight um, mile diameter and we can kind of say okay within this boundary um, I think it should be the structure not necessarily the property so if your structure is within that you can't have it if your structure is outside of that you can um, and again really focusing on just those residential type neighborhoods um, and so I went on to say dwelling units in R3, B1, or B2 zones are not limited to the number of allowable units and the reason that I thought about that is you know right now your apartment buildings are rental units and um, they are more conducive to the people coming and going. The people in those neighborhoods are used to people coming and going. Yeah. And um, so I just thought, why should we limit that? Um, because I don't think we are worried about changing those neighborhoods. You know, again, we're more focused on what it does to our residences. Um, and so that's why I struck through, I initially had a maximum of eight houses per established residential subdivision may be used and or registered. I almost think we should strike through that, not even consider that. And the reason for that is <clears throat> how do you view a subdivision? So um, just a vineyard, we have three different phases. Technically, those are three different subdivisions. Do you get into the nuts and bolts of it? So. I just kind of rethought that and I, I just overall I think if a new developer came in they absolutely do not want these they could deed restrict their subdivision um, and say no we're gonna handle that with our HOA 
Um, we're not going to allow short-term rental in our subdivisions. And um, otherwise, w we can limit density based on a measurable like this. Um, and then I put maximum occupant load is 200 to off-street parking. Again, I think for those applications that come in to me, that would have to be a very clear cut. I have two and here they are. Um, so if it was questionable, I think I would ask them to come to the board for approval. Um, of course, life safety inspection, um, that they must have uh, contact information for the owner or on-call rep um, posted for any um, emergencies that may arise. Um, just a general statement, if any of these provisions cannot be met, the property owner shall make application for a conditional use permit to the Board of Adjustments. Um, and then lastly, just a general safe, clean, and sanitary conditions of the interior and exterior shall be maintained in accordance with the current property maintenance code. Violations of this code or other applicable ordinances shall be subject to penalties of the code or ordinance as cited three or more notices of vi notice of violations I should say notices of violation <laughs> Sorry. Um, for the registered property in a one-year period will be evaluated by the codes and planning office and take to, taken to code enforcement board for um, possible revocation of the permit for short-term rental couple things I wanted to ask you guys is should we uh, um, consider duplexes individually or per building so I've you know I have said um, so with this you know again if with looking at these little circles you think does it matter if that's a house or a duplex Any thoughts on whether we should consider if duplexes should only be permitted to have one unit within that density requirement or could both of those units be, would it just be like per address? You wouldn't because duplexes by the nature of them um, don't, have pro don't have a property line so it would always be one owner now you you might have a situation like miss hogg has where she has a leasee that wants to do that um and that's really kind of where i thought you know we need to have that discussion and again we don't have to make decisions tonight it's just these are things i'm trying to think through and making sure that i capture what we want in these regulations and um, yeah. so I, th I think we need to. I'm trying to think of the downside of, of, um, of not considering, uh, downside of, um, yeah, not considering individually and nothing has come into mind, right? Because even if you are, have a lease situation and, and you're, you're, you own the property and you need the other duplex like just because you have that um, conditional use doesn't mean you have to do the conditional use, correct right mm -hmm. yeah yeah I personally don't think it matters if it's a house or a duplex I don't see a big change um, again it's still one structure and the neighbors are probably going to be impacted the same whether it's one or two units i did just want to throw that out there to make sure that um the because the way i wrote it was um dwelling units or duplexes so i wrote it as it's the building could be okay. registered and, and then as far as being non-transferable i just um you know uh, it's just an application process if they meet the boxes then uh, they get that that use I'm trying to think w what is the benefit then of of it being non-transferable I guess that might 
be a potential opportunity say the property sells and the new owner just doesn't uh, doesn't realize they need to quickly get their conditional use set in and then somebody next to them beats them to it like is that the idea so it would give an opportunity for, for I think it's more for me about um, the business license and taxing gotcha so we okay. want to make sure that we know who the owner is we know how they're using the property that yep. they have a life safety check that they have a business license that they're paying transit room tax and so it's a way for um, not just my office but for the city to know how these properties are being used okay yeah makes sense Well, and that's why I wanted to write it in the regulation that that this gives us a leg to stand on when the new owner doesn't have a business license. I have a leg to stand on to say you're required to have this. You're required to pay transient room tax. Yep. You know, if it's clearly spelled out, it's so much easier than if I have to find a way to enforce it. <laughs> Um, so the other thing I want to talk about is um, a possible registration fee. Um, I, so that's something I'm going to have to uh, adopt as part of our fee schedule. And um, I felt like 150 per year is fair. Um, there is um, an administrative cost to us reviewing the applications, um, you know, just the upkeep and maintenance of we again have to review these on occasion and um, I don't know if you guys have any comments about that but that was the number I kind of had in my head um, again just making the statement that I think a possible way to restrict these um, in totality for a subdivision would be deed restrictions I don't know that that's anything that's happening out in the world um, but I, I kind of thought that's interesting. Um, if short-term rental has negatively affected neighborhoods, if people were doing that, and again, I don't know. I just, you know, I just think that is a way that it could be accomplished. Um, one other last comment I have is I did not add a 10 p.m. check-in time, but I do think I would make that a hard and fast rule on here just to try to protect those neighbors so I will add that as another item on here that it's just a mandatory check-in time no later than 10 um, to try to protect those neighbors a little bit more and so basically what would happen is with the instance that um, the two Center Street addresses, you know, one would have gotten it, the other one would have had to come for approval. And not to say that you guys would or wouldn't approve it, I, you know, I think, I th but that what that does for us is that gives us the opportunity to say, okay, we look at the map, we see how many there are on that street, and um, it gives those neighbors the opportunity to come and voice their um, express their concerns at a public hearing if it is starting to change the dynamics you look like you want to ask me something I'm just thinking about conditional <laughs> conditional uses where <laughs> where um, where it's a room and not the entire dwelling um, I mean, there's not really a delineation for that uh, how could that impact things well perhaps the people that live there are taking up all the off-street parking like yes there are two off-street parking they want to get a conditional permit for uh, to be able to do a short-term rental in a room but um, uh, but they're taking up all the off-street parking themselves. Well, I think where I, the way that I have um, captured this, that it 
again, we're really talking about what's coming in front of us. So the provisions for short-term rental shall apply to detached single-family dwellings, duplexes, and multifamily dwellings. I have so captured that as this applies to the entire unit. So again, if you want to do something different than that, I think you come to the board. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that gets the board out of every consideration. I just think what this does is this helps to um, alleviate this kind of push on short-term rental. It, it helps us to be able to administratively approve probably the majority of them. And then those other instances that things that we haven't considered or where, where they're trying to do something that doesn't fit in this box, that they come to the board and the board has the opportunity to review those on a case by case. Well, and, and Danny, my comment to that is, um, so again, that if he, if that application were to come into the city, uh, into our office, and it was specific to say that they wanted a tent, um, well, I would first, I, I would decline that because again, I think it's really clear in our city ordinance um, I think that if we, um, but, but let's say just for the sake of it, instead of a tent, he had said an RV, right? So I want to, so if that application comes to us for RV, RV, then I think that's automatically coming to the board because it does not fit in this little box of a dwelling unit. Um, I think that we need to, on the application, ask the right questions um you know when we're developing this application um you know we need to make sure that we are understanding they are applying for the whole house how many bedrooms how many bathrooms how many off street parking that my office is doing our due diligence to make sure that it does fit in this box what they want and then i think in anything outside of that um, either is already regulated by city ordinance or it comes again for those the, this is going to be those special approvals those things that aren't just the single house or but I think you're right I think the application itself is going to be important and um, you know we we did not have the knowledge that a tent or no, outside it, camping it was, was part not, of this application. It was not on the application. There were a couple of addresses that were transferred to the list that you have, and then it just said um, Airbnb according to 406.6. That was it. It was. Yeah. Right, yeah. I think this is a, uh, a smart way to move forward um, and administratively and uh, you know there's a cost to our time as well so there is yeah. um, so my next statement to that is um, we are working on new software um, for the codes office um, where we will be doing online permitting and um, we're hoping to, well, the kind of go live for that is July 1st. So I think as of July 1, we would be able to be set up and prepared for them to do an online application and be able to register these annually with us. In the interim, 
if we pass these regulations, you know, we'll have to figure out some office procedures in that interim period. Um, but we are looking at a complete um, overhaul or update to our um, land management and development ordinance, which this is a part of the regulations. Um, I'm kind of looking at our uh, middle of this first quarter, so April, May, to adopt those regulations. So um, we have a couple options in trying to move forward with specifically these regulations. We could um, take this to Planning Commission, um, go ahead and take this, this by itself for an ordinance change, or we could wait and have it be part of the complete update, um, which should be happening in the next two, three months. So that was my other question. I wanted to just get some feedback from you guys. Um, I know we've had a lot of these coming in, um, and I understand that at some point we change the regulations, right? We don't we don't continue having meetings um, um, for approval, approval, approval. So I, you know, I applaud you, Josh. I appreciate you bringing that up to say, yeah, we just need to change our regulations, right? So what kind of um, would you all like for me to proceed with getting this standalone ordinance changed, or would you are you satisfied if we can get this done in the next? two to three months. I'm good to just do it all at one time. Okay. That's certainly what I would prefer, but I will take the recommendation of the board either way. And um, on that one eighth and one eighth mile diameter, I, I, I take it that would include those short term conditional uh, use approvals that have been made so far I think or? we have to make provisions for that if that's the case so um, in other words they would be they would be on the map um, or, or no yeah I need to check with our attorney to okay. see because they had a different approval process right and they were prior to these regulations right I'm apt to think that they would say no they're not on the map like they may okay. be on the map but I don't know that they're gonna that we would limit the eighth mile around them you know gotcha. we, we want to indicate them because we want to know where they are and right. we okay. will notify them to you know that now you need to register annually all these things but gotcha. okay. um, I think that's but in terms of identifying them. the density that it, it would be a clean slate that's what I think, but I will check with our corporate counsel right. um, to see what their thinking is. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Well, I, I, unrelated oh. and, and a little bit off topic, but uh, I'm sure it relates somehow, especially if this is, uh, uh, there's this overall planning um, uh, regulations. Um, just uh, my wife asked me about this was uh, what happened to the tiny home conversation when we had real uh, I know it's not as much of an issue now with with uh, with the housing um, not as uh, not as hot as it was before but is that something that's that's being explored at all in terms of um, I don't I don't know how else to say it tiny tiny houses or yeah yeah so Kentucky actually um, in the in the Kentucky Building Code, they wrote provisions for that have been accepted statewide for tiny houses. Oh, is that right? Yep. I didn't know that. So, okay. um, so know. if you go to the website for the Kentucky Department of Housing, Building, and Construction, and you look at the, um, so it's going to be the uh, 2018 Kentucky Residential Code. Um, they set um, guidelines for what those tiny houses have to look like. So basically, they have to be on a um, permanent foundation. They have 
um, allowances for smaller habitable rooms and spaces if you're going to put a loft in it they tell you exactly the dimensions that you have to have for your now, minimum dimensions I should say because you can make them larger than that but they give you um, very specific guidelines for what tiny houses have to do uh, or have to look like and um, so we've not had any um, who that have applied for any permits okay. um, but I was really glad to see that the state addressed that and that mm. we have a statewide standard um, to know how those need to be addressed for us it would look no different than a um, application for a regular house because again they have to be on that permanent foundation I think the only time we would need to look at it is if we were going to get like a development of the other um, I think we would then look at um, if they're all on one property doesn't really matter but if they're going to be sold off individually mm. um, then we might would need to look at you know um, lot size regulations and those kind of things yeah. so far we've not had that request interesting thanks yep, yep. thank you right. do we have to make it a motion no. to okay great. no we can just you can just <laughs> say we're done now <laughs>